Our speaker tonight is obviously Mr. Cameron Babb. He was born in Columbia, Missouri and moved later to St. Louis, Missouri when he was about seven years old. He was a four-star player coming out of high school, which is really, really good. Um, had an injury his senior year, had an ACL tear, um, which probably would have been a five-star player um, because he was already in the top 100 players of the country right there already. Cam played five seasons with the Buckeyes and graduated with two degrees. He's got, had a bachelor's degree in communications and then a master's degree in kinesiology. He needed that one, didn't he? <laughs> Work on the knees. So, and is now, he's now pursuing a master's divinity at another college right now, but he's still working for Ohio State. Um, he was a four-time OSU scholar athlete and a four-time academic All Big Ten uh, honoree. So he's not just good looking, he's smart too, so. <laughs> he was voted a team captain twice. Not too many guys did that. A lot of guys get uh, voted team captain once. He was voted twice by his teammates. That's because he's a leader in who he was. Um, he's selected as Ohio State's third honoree for the Bill Willis Block O jersey, which is the jersey with the number uh, zero on it, and it's, it's basically for the Block O. It's actually a big honor, and it's given to the player who exhibits the Willis traits of toughness, accountability, and of highest character. So if you know the story of Ga uh, Cam, uh, he went through four knee surgeries, four ACL tears. Um, rehab for those are nine months to a year at each one of them. And, uh, and he played all years and he, and he made it through all that. And his story is an amazing one. So he really got, came to close to, to Christ in that third ACL tear. And uh, it, what happened was uh, after his fifth year, uh, obviously the, in the game versus Indiana, he, uh, him and CJ hooked up for a touchdown. And what happened in the end zone is something you just, you just don't see. Um, to me, it was a very profound uh, uh, thing. Uh, it really went way past football. And um, when the thing that really struck me the most is when, that, when he went into the end zone and to give glory to God and uh, to thank God, all his teammates gathered around him and put their hands, sorry, <laughs> and they put their arms around uh, to, to stop, to, to let him to have his time to honor God and, and until he was ready. And so um, it was quite an incredible moment. I want to give thanks to everybody that is here that's brought me here, but I also want to give thanks uh, to Jesus. And uh, I want to just take a minute, if we can all just bow our heads real quick and um, I'm just going to welcome him as, as uh, he talks through me, I guess you can say. Um, so, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I just, I thank you for, for you. I thank you for how beautiful you are. I thank you for how wonderful you are. I thank you um, for the goodness of God through grace and mercy, through Jesus on the cross, and the fact that 2,000 years later, you are still knocking at the door of our hearts, Father God, and that you are inviting us in to eat with you, Father God. So I just thank you for everybody that's in the room today. Um, I thank you for the one that will, will hear message. I, I pray that everybody would hear it and receive it no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord for, no matter if we don't walk with you, Jesus. I thank you that tonight is the night that we can turn our eyes and our hearts towards you. So Father, allow, as I talk, um, everybody that hears my voice, allow their minds and their hearts to be fixated on how great and wonderful you truly are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, man, so first off, Dwight, Tom, thank you guys for coming up to Columbus and uh, having paying for my lunch. They paid for my lunch, so uh, that was awesome. I was grateful for it, uh, but thank you guys for coming up and um, really just inviting me to come speak. Um, I heard there was a coach last year that came, and I hope uh, I can do as good as he did. Um, so again, my name is Cameron Babb. Obviously, you saw the video. Um, played for Ohio State from 2018 to 2022, um, and it was really a story that I did not write. Um, if I was 15, 16, 17 years old, I would have written it completely different. Um, I'd probably be making a lot of money right now, um, drafted, playing for, I was a Cowboys fan growing up because my dad, um, sadly, I would like to say sadly, we were struggling a little bit, we're struggling, but I'm more of like a Texans fan now, Cardinals, Bills, Jets, I'm all over the place now, um, so uh, exactly, free agent, free agent. Bengals, Bengals fan, yeah, but I like to watch the Bengals. Um, so yeah, but I really, uh, what's on my heart tonight is really just share my story. Um, but hopefully, 
not talk about me as much. Um, but I hope that you would hear again the story of this man, Christ Jesus, that got on the cross, um, suffered all things, um, the only innocent one that's ever lived. Um, a lot of people, they look at, you know, me or you look at, we look at each other and say, oh, that's a good person right there. That's a great person. Um, but as I read the Bible and as I look at myself, as I know the thoughts that I've had, the, the actions that I've had, um, if you saw my whole life from the moment I was born to now, you'd probably think uh, a little bit differently about me. And you'll say, dang, how can God use a man like that? So I'm no different than the worst, worst person that's ever lived because even if he's done a, he or she has done a certain action, I've thought probably that same exact thing. And the only difference between me and somebody that doesn't uh, know Jesus is, is Jesus. I have gotten the privilege and the opportunity just as he reached his hand to me to put my hand out with my weak, the weakest attempt that I could possibly give him and just he grabbed my hand and he pulled me out from the depths of my own sin and so the, the testimony that you just saw is nothing of me. The perseverance that I had getting past four after that touchdown, technically five ACLs, it was nothing of me. It was only so that I could get up and proclaim about this Jesus that I've gotten to know even just a little bit, just a little bit. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is he's so eternal. And you have to keep me on time, too. I know I got to get into my story. No, you're good. You're good. He's so eternal. So. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for a thousand years, you're still farther away from him. Like he's this eternal God, right? So it's like if I've been knowing him for, I've only been following him for four years, right? So I haven't even, if there's steps all the way up to Jesus, I haven't even really flinched. I haven't even taken the first step to getting to know him. Because he's that amazing, he's that beautiful, he's that wonderful. And we'll, we'll never have, I will never have arrived there to where I know everything about him. I believe that with the depths of my heart, he's so amazing, so beautifully, so wonderful. Even when I'm with him, I will still be in awe, and I don't, I don't understand it. How can you be this good? How can you be this loving? So this Christian walk, this walk to go out and to create disciples, to grab the little one, to grab the old one, and to tell them about this Jesus, and then walk with them. The whole point is to take our eyes off of ourselves and to look at him. Because the longer we look at ourselves, we'll drop the ball every single time. Because camera within myself, I can't do anything. I can't do anything to earn his love or to take away his love. But it's a free gift. Salvation is this free gift. And so many people turn their back on him time and time again, just like me. So right now you see a man up here that's talking about Jesus, but it is a broken man without him. It is a man that sees his sin and that in my sin, all I can do, even when I want to run away because I know my sin, He's a father that just draws me to him every single time. And so I go into college after I tore my first ACL, not knowing this at all. I know some of you heard my story in the back, so hopefully this doesn't get boring for you. Basically, nine to 12 months of rehab. Don't have any confidence because I just tore my ACL. I'm at a new school with new uh, you know, friends and stuff from all over the country. Um, do a drill, put my foot on the ground, boom, I tear my other ACL. Right? So that's two ACLs, and at this point in my life, I was like, okay, it's freshman year, um, I don't know the playbook at all, for real, it's a lot going through my mind, I gotta get right with the playbook, so it's time for me, okay, I can get in the playbook and rehab and catch up a little bit, get stronger, faster. But in the midst of that, when we were playing, it was always football over here, practicing all the healthy guys, but then the injured guys were always over here. So when was the only, when the, I, felt, I felt isolated many, many times, so when was the only time that I could feel like I was with the team? Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday nights. Sometimes like Tuesdays maybe, sometimes. Sad to say. And now the world will tell you if you just do this, you'll feel good. If you just chase this dream, again, I'm not telling you not to chase your dreams or anything like that. But so many times we have our dream above him. And what I've learned and what I am learning is he will not play second in our lives and in our hearts. He will not, he's a jealous father, he's jealous for you which is beautiful, he, he wants you, right? And so I'm going out on High Street of Columbus and uh, I'm enjoying my time. I know there's little ones in here, or smaller, you know, not so little, but younger kids in here. But the reality is this world will offer you all these things. So when you leave your parents' house, they will offer you these things. They will offer you the drugs, they will offer you the alcohol, they will offer you the sex, they will offer you whatever it is to give you. And they will say, it feels good, it will take the pain away and you can have fun with it. 
But like I said in the back earlier, you would dig your you would dig yourself into a hole so deep that you can't get yourself out. And so me, I'll go on high street and I would indulge in all these things, indulge in everything I could, and have fun. I'm telling you, I was having fun while I was doing it. But like I said in the back as well, it says in the Bible, sin is pleasurable for a season, for a season of your life, it's enjoyable. And then you get to a point when you recognize, dang, what am I doing? Who have I become? So I lay my head on the pillow at night and I would just cry silently because I had a roommate. Or I'd go into the bathroom, I would turn on the shower and I would cry with the pain inside of me. But I would walk into the Woody Hayes Athletic Facility, which is where we practice, and I would have a smile on my face. And people would ask me and they would think, you're so strong, you're so, you're so, you're so awesome because you keep coming back day after day after day. But they didn't really know what was going on in my heart. So just like you, you may walk, get up even in your house every single day, but you might be going through something. You might put on this fake smile, but the one that really knows is you and Jesus. So the time of coming to Jesus and trying to look good and look perfect is over with. These kids, another camp band that was ni that's 19 years old right now, that's dying in his sin, he needs us. He needs us to get close to Jesus and to see Jesus so that when somebody comes to him and he has all these problems in his life and he's going down this dark path, the only solution that we can give them is him. Because there's nothing else. There's nothing else. If you give Cam Bab all these programs and all these great things that are great, eventually Cam Bab will run into more problems. Eventually Cam Bab will die someday and he will see Jesus. And so I do a year, year of rehab again. So this is on my third, second or second, going on to my third. Same exact drill, I get up to the line, I'm in my mind, I'm like, dang, this is the same drill I just did. I've been working a year. Put my foot in the ground, boom, snap. Go down again, this is the third one. I came in with Chris Olave, if you guys know him, and some other guys. I throw my helmet down, I tell Chris, I'm like, I'm done, I can't do it no more. I go into the training room, I'm crying. It's just me, because they're still practicing. Not thinking a thing about Jesus at all. So as I talk about this too, I want you to think in your life, one of the times that you've walked away it mentions in the Bible, too, there's a, there's a time where it mentions we, they left their first love. Where believers have left their first love. So whether you know Jesus or you don't, some of us have left our first love. Right? So I tell Coach Day and Coach Harlow, I'm going to go home to try to figure things out. They let me try to get on a plane. Or they give me a plane flight for later that evening or the next day, basically. So this was on a Thursday. I get a flight for Friday. Friday morning. Ohio State works fast. Um, go to get on this plane. They wouldn't let me on a plane, right? Plane takes off. They're like, oh, something happened in the system. We don't know what happened. They find out it wasn't anything on my end. It was on their end. So they buy another flight or get me booked for another flight later that evening. It's on that same Friday. I Uber back to the dorms, planning to Uber to the airport again. So spending a lot of money on Ubers at this point. And as I Uber, I met a young man by the name of Darnell. He's about my age right now. And just like we have this mission of sharing the gospel with the kids, what was it, uh, pre-K to eighth grade, is that what it is? Well, I'm 19. But this young man had the boldness to share Jesus to a young man that was not listening at all. He was not listening, but he was, he was planting a seed and he was going to try to water it, believing and trusting that it's not his words, but it's Jesus, the love of Jesus that will convict this young man's heart and will show that, look, if you would just see that there's a God that loves you so much that he doesn't want you to just stay in your sin, but he's created a way for you to leave your sin and to turn towards him. Right. He's sharing the gospel with me. We pull up to the airport. He's like, man, can I pray for you? I'm like, sure, I've prayed before. I prayed over my food, and you know, I've, you know, I've prayed with. Uh, I got a grandmother, Gigi. I got to shout her out every time I uh, talk about her because she has a beautiful heart and loves Jesus. All right? So yeah, I prayed with Gigi before. And he's like, okay, man, can uh, can I reach back and touch your knee? And I'm like, sure, man. That's a little weird, but we can do it. All right? We can do it. I was like, I just met you five minutes ago. It's all right. It's all right. And as he as he reached back and as he touched my knee. All the moments when I was looking at the things of this world, there was, a, there was a God that was looking down on me. And he saw me in the shower, and he saw me in the car, he saw me walking to class. He saw me, and as he touched my knee, I just felt God 
the Holy Spirit. I just felt him wrap. It was like it was like a little kid in the in the rain or in the snow. And the only thing that can comfort him is God himself. And it's like he just wrapped himself around me, put me in this blanket and just held me. He just held me. Before Darnell even said a word, he just held me. I had no other answer at this point in my life. I had no other answer. I couldn't look to the left. I couldn't look to the right. I couldn't look forward. I couldn't look backward. I've tried football. I've tried the girls. I've tried the drugs. I've tried the alcohol. I've tried everything I possibly could. The only thing I could do now is look up. That's it. Not, not just with my eyes, but with my heart. Because I had every, I didn't have any, I needed something. I needed him. And so at that point, when I experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit right there in that car, it wasn't just something that I wanted anymore. It was something that I needed. Jesus, if this is you, if this is that God that, that I've heard about my whole life, I went to church, I heard about him my whole life, but I thought I knew him. If this is, if this is the God that Gigi told me about, I need you. Because everything that Darnell started to pray after that, nobody was with me. He started to say things about times when I was in the shower, times when I was, you know, by myself and nobody was there. So how could Darnell know? And I'm telling you, we talk about the church. We talk about a building, the church. God is everywhere. He sees everything. So how we act in a church is no different than how we act on a Saturday night or on a Thursday night. Or in the house when it's just you and your wife or when I'm in uh, my dorm with just me and my roommate, how I treat them. It's no different. He's everywhere and he sees everything. But he wants your heart. He wanted my heart. But he had to break me down physically. He had to break me down so that I didn't just want football, but I want him. Because he doesn't play second because he loves us too much to play second. He loves us too much to play second. And so at that moment, uh, Darnell invited me to church that next week. I go to church, um, sit in the front row, uh, very nervous, very timid, uh, and the pastor preaches the gospel. And he says, today you have a choice. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to serve Jesus, serve Jesus. If you're going to serve the devil, serve the devil. But you can't eat off of two plates. Choose today who you will serve. But there's a grace, and there's a mercy, and there's a love that is offered to you. And to know this man, Christ Jesus, is better than anything that this world can give you. But he's here with his hand out. Will you grab him? Right? And so I try to grab him. I try to repent of my sins. I try to give him my heart, surrender my life, surrender my heart. I didn't even know how to do that. So now I go through a time span of a month going out on Saturday, but going to church, you're getting convicted. So I like to say this. Somebody told me this. It's almost like you have too much sin to enjoy this God that you encountered but you have too much of this God that you encountered to go back to the sin you once loved. See, the thing about God is, it's almost like I heard this guy, Paul Washer, he's a preacher, he said, if you get smacked by a bus and you live from it, you'll come out getting smacked by a bus a little differently. You'll be a little different after that, right? So how much bigger is God than that bus? So how can I experience Jesus and continue to live the life that I once lived after I encountered the one that created the universe. You can't. Because you can't serve two masters. You can't. You're going to end up hating both. You love one and hate the other, and then love the other and hate the one. So I had to choose. And it was a moment in my bathroom, going back to the bathroom. I don't know why I was in the bathroom. <laughs> I turn on some worship music. Got on my knees or however I did it. I probably said a lot of things. Probably cried out and did a lot of different things. But I knew at that moment, God had my whole heart. It was, I entrusted, I, there was a cliff. And I said, Jesus, I'm going to jump off this cliff and I'm going to trust you with my whole life. It's no longer me, but it's you. It's no longer I, but it's Christ in me. But I desire you. I need you to fill me because I need you to change me so I can see you, so that I can tell others about this God that I've experienced. But not only just so I can tell people, but so I can know you myself. A year from that, tear my right ACL. So now it's right, left, left, right. This is the same one I tore in high school. This was like four years ago. I'm like, dang. Right? But there's something different in this moment. Yes, it hurt. Yes, there was pain. Yes, I didn't want that to happen. I didn't. I go into the training room, and I look behind me maybe five minutes later, and I just see a swarm of people coming in. 
teammate after teammate after teammate after teammate. All of a sudden, I'm on this training table, and people are surrounding me. And they ask, okay, Cam, we'll pray. Let's pray. Because no way this just happened again. No way. We've seen the work that you've put in. We've seen everything. No way it just happened again. But what's the next step for, for a believer? This is the moment when you tell them about Jesus. This is the moment when you tell them about this God that has shown you compassion. I just told them earlier. It's like when I look at you guys, it's like, Jesus, how do you see them? Some people he looks at, he looks at into the crowd, he looks into their hearts, and it's like he has compassion on them because he sees them like sheep without a shepherd. But he also says, I leave the 99 to go find the one. He leaves it. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. And when one sinner repents of their sin and they turn to Jesus, heaven rejoices. Because there was a price that was paid for you and for me. And so many of us in America have got complacent because we've heard of Jesus our whole lives, but we don't really know him. And I'm speaking to myself. We don't really know him the way he desires us to know him. And so this message to you today is just to encourage you to go after him. And when you fall, to recognize that there's a father that's right there. Just hug him and never let go. And when you do let go, he will grab you. And so I told my teammates about this man. Look, I know this just happened. But there's a hope that's in me that no matter what happens in my life, my hope is no longer in what we can see, but it's in what we can't see. And then a year later, sorry, I'm jumping all around, get to score that touchdown. And I get to profess about this man, this God that I have gotten to know and that I desire to know. So I get on my knees, and that was for the times when I was in my room, and it was just me and him. Because what does he say? So many people, we do things, and now, okay, let's post it to the world. Let the world see it. But what does Jesus do? He says, when you pray, shut the door behind you and go to your heavenly Father and pray in secret. Pray in secret. Jesus, what did he do? He would do miracles, but then he would often, it says he often withdrew to the wilderness to spend time. To, I, well, he didn't say to spend time, but often withdrew to the wilderness. And you ask, okay, what was Jesus doing in the wilderness? There's no music. He doesn't have to repent for any sins. So what was he doing? And I heard another man say this. Could it not just be that he loved the Father so much that he just wanted to withdraw and just be with the Father? How many times do we withdraw to be with him? Yes, yeah, so that he can pour his love on us so that we can go out and make disciples and, and do whatever he's called us to do. But how many times do we just go to just be with him because he is him? So that is my encouragement to you today. And that is the, the journey that I'm on. Psalm 27, 4. David says this. He says, my one desire, my one desire is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. And then it says this, to behold his beauty. And to inquire in his temple, to ask questions. How many times have we just, oh, this is God. We know the gospel. We know he got on the cross. We know this. We've heard it our whole life. But there's depths to it. There's depths. Read the same scripture for eternity. If you have one scripture, one verse, John 3.16, if you had that one verse and that's all you had, I bet you we could do a lot with that one verse forever. I bet you we could. Because there's no end to him. There's no end to him. So I, I'm saying all this to say and to ask the question, what's on your heart? Who's on your heart? What's on your mind? What do you think about throughout the day? What are you chasing after? Because today, right now, 2024 in America, we need Jesus. We've always needed him. We need him. And believers like myself have fallen short, and we will always fall short, but we have fallen short not to just tell people about Jesus, but to just see Jesus. Because if we just see Jesus for who he is in the dark, when it's just us and him, then everything else will take care of itself. But we see all the outside. We see the ministry. We see the, everything that he's doing. We want to be a part of it, which is great. But I don't want Jesus for that. So that brings me to a story of a woman. And again, I love my Gigi. And I'm so uh, thankful for women that have truly, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my life, have been the strength 
in my life, behind the scenes in prayer and, be and behind the scenes of knowing Jesus so that a young Cam, when he's doing stupid stuff, I have this praying grandmother that has prayed for me and, and watched over me. But there's a woman in the Bible that I look up to. Her name is Mary. Not the mother of Jesus, but another Mary. People call her Mary of Bethany. I think she's mentioned three times, maybe twice. I'm not too sure. But there's one story. It's about her and her, uh, her sister, Martha. And uh, Jesus comes. Again, God in the flesh. He's coming. He's right there. It's like, Jesus is right in front of you. You know he's Jesus. You believe him to be God. So he comes to your house. What are you going to do? You're going to clean up, make sure you know there's vacuum, make sure the table's clean, right? Jesus is sitting there talking. He's sitting, right? I just picture he's just chilling. The Bible that we have, it's literally like pouring out of his mouth because he is God. The words that we read, they, he is him. He's him. And so that he's just talking to the disciples. It says, Mary Bethany, she's sitting right here, just looking at him. Just listening to every single word that's coming off of his tongue. Just listening. And her sister, Martha, she's cleaning. She's probably cooking, probably, again, paraphrasing, doing all these different things. Right? She looks at Mary and she's like, Jesus, why don't you tell her to help? She's not helping me. But what's the difference between Mary and Martha? Mary saw Jesus for who he truly was. And so there's nothing more valuable than what he's telling me. There's nothing more valuable than it. All the work that you can give him, you can do for him, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's not valuable, because it is. But it's not more valuable than him. Right? And so what does Jesus tell Martha? Paraphrasing. He says, Mary, your sister, she's chosen the good thing. The eternal thing. That's what she's chosen. See, because what you do, the work, all the things that I, you know, I do, you know, again, this is paraphrasing. That touchdown, that touchdown within itself fades. Ten years from now, 20 years from now, people might forget it. Who won the national championship 10 years ago? 13 years ago? You don't know. Who was the MVP of that game? You don't know. Right? But yet we have a Bible, and it's described as these words are powerful. They're sharper than a two-edged sword, and they bring life. They change me from the inside out. And yet me, I'm talking to me as well, we neglect it daily for other things. And so today is the day where we can turn to him and be like Martha or Mary. And we can look at him through his scripture and through time alone with him so that when we do go out, we can tell the world not just about this religion, but we can tell him about the person Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have gone to know in the secret place. When it's just you and him, and he sees all your scars, and he sees your hurt, and he sees your pain. That is my heart cry. That is my goal that I found out when I was 19 years old, when I was 20 years old, and an Uber driver. And he said, look, I know you, you see your sin. I know you do. There is no sin more stronger than his blood and what he's done on the cross. So what I encourage you to do, there's a song, I don't know what it's exactly called. It's basically talking about the blood, and his blood makes me whiter than snow. So tonight, as we all go home, whenever you get alone, I encourage all of us to turn to Jesus in our sin, to repent of our sin. I'm faced towards my sin, and I decide I'm going to turn my back on it, and I'm going to turn towards you. And I'm believing that you're going to draw me near. It's like a magnet. You're just going to draw me near to yourself. And in that, you will be embraced with a hug and with a love knowing that he's paid the price for you and that he cares about you and he desires you. What kind of God do we serve that he thinks about man? The big things in your life, but also the little. He wants to be not just in your life, but he wants to have your life. So the, the call of the gospel is to die to ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to choose him every single day. And when we don't choose him, to recognize that and to run towards him. So that America, so that the world can see Jesus for not who we think he is, but for who he is. So again, I just want to thank you guys for letting me speak today. But I pray that you would just see Jesus in your own life um, like I've seen him in mine. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.